Tonight, they're off. Thanksgiving travelers get an early start going over the river and through the woods, and this year, through the scanner. I'm Katie Couric. Also tonight, the clash of the Koreas. The North and South exchange artillery fire in one of the most dangerous confrontations since the Korean War. The baby boom that could bust Social Security should the retirement age be raised for tens of millions of Americans. And April in the Abbey, William and Kate set the date for their royal wedding. From CBS News World Headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. Good evening, everyone. The Thanksgiving getaway is underway. Travelers dealing with crowded roads, gas prices 24 cents higher than last year, crowded planes, the security concerns that come with every holiday these days, and now the new screening procedures at the airports. None of that is keeping an estimated 42 million Americans from traveling this Thanksgiving, 11 percent more than last year. We have correspondents at two of the nation's busiest airports tonight. Mark Strassman is in Atlanta, but first, Dean Reynolds is in Chicago tonight. Dean, these new measures aren't really keeping people away from the airports, are they? No, Katie, they're not. In fact, the pace is quickening here at O'Hare. The lines are beginning to grow. Despite the controversy over these airline security issues, AAA says airline flight travel in this holiday season will increase this year. Travelers today tried to get out ahead of the expected holiday wave at a number of U.S. airports. And you've got pent-up travel demand for people that didn't take their trip last year. And though air travel is projected to be up 3.5 percent this time around, few delays were reported over much of the country, this afternoon at least. But everything's fully staffed and ready to go and things are going rather well. The weather was cooperating for those hitting the roads, rails or runways. But airport officials were bracing for criticism of the enhanced security measures now in place. The vast majority of travelers took it all in stride. I think people are making a big fuss over nothing, really. But others disagreed. Only no, my husband and can see my buddy. The TSA says that at most only 3% of travelers are getting padded down, roughly 60,000 out of 2 million a day. But an online protest campaign is causing concerns. Businessman Brian Sodergren is urging travelers to opt out of the 10-second body scan and insist on a slower pat-down as a way to gum up a system he finds invasive and unnecessary. And how much are we willing to let government uh, poke and prod us and are we willing to let them see under our clothes just because we bought a plane ticket? Or Sodergren says he'll drive this Thanksgiving rather than submit to the TSA rules. But air travelers worry that if some flyers do what he wants, it could make a bad situation worse. And I would be more frustrated with the people that are planning the boycott than actually the, uh, um, uh, than the security itself to just to get done. We all want to go home. And that's why Robert Himes traveled from Pennsylvania to Wisconsin by car. We've been through airports before with our kids, but the, the hassle through the airport with kids is, is quite a bit. To expedite things at the airport, the TSA announced today that flight attendants will not have to submit to those enhanced security measures the rest of us will have to go through. Pilots were exempted last Friday. Katie? Dean Reynolds at Chicago's O'Hare Airport tonight. Dean, thank you. 69 airports all across the country are now equipped with those body scanners. Homeland Security reported today that 99 percent of passengers singled out for a scanning agree to it rather than undergo a pat down. And Mark Strassman tells us most Americans support this kind of screening if that's what it takes to stop a terrorist. This is terrorist Mohammed Atta the morning of 9-11, going through airport security in Portland, Maine. I'm staring at him and he's staring back at me. Gate agent Mike Tui handed Atta his boarding pass and is haunted by a gut feeling he had about the terrorist. Hours later, Atta piloted a hijacked plane into the World Trade Center. They only have to succeed one time. We have to be correct 100% of the time. After the so-called underwear bomber failed to blow up an American airliner last Christmas Day, the TSA accelerated installing its full-body scanners, trying to balance the terror threat against the clamor over security scans, pat-downs, and the battle cry, don't touch my junk. 
Just last week, a CBS News poll showed 81% of Americans favored full-body scanners. But this week, in another poll, only 64% support them, and half oppose pat-downs. They're whining. I'm sorry. What's more important to you, your junk or your safety? And some airport safety experts believe the scans and pat-downs are still nowhere near enough. They must be proactive and not reactive. Isaac Yafet is the former security chief of Israel's El Al, the airline with the world's toughest security. Every passenger is interviewed before boarding. Yafet says that TSA's approach is fundamentally wrong, too reliant on technology and luck. Okay, please come on out. Interview people. Check their passport. Ask the questions. It's not complicated. complicated. But it is challenging. Just here in Atlanta, 1.7 million people will pass through this airport over Thanksgiving break. And to call it a success, TSA must do its job with every one of them. Katie? Mark Strassman in Atlanta. Mark, thank you so much. And turning overseas, a confrontation today between the two Koreas. They fired artillery shells at each other after the North warned the South to stop military drills near their sea border. Two South Koreans were killed and 18 were wounded. The White House blames the North and says President Obama is, quote, outraged. Late today, his national security team met to discuss how to respond. Celia Hatton has more on the clash between the Koreas. <laughs> Residents on the South Korean island of Yongpyong ran for their lives as North and South Korea exchanged artillery fire for an hour. Dozens of shells rained down on the island and its fishing village near the disputed Korean border. It was like war. My house burned down, says this resident, one of 1,200 civilians who were evacuated from the now empty island. It was the worst military confrontation between the Koreas in decades. As soon as the shooting stopped, a war of words began, with each country claiming the other fired the first shots. All this took place amid heightened tensions on the Korean peninsula. North Korea is in the process of passing power from the country's ailing leader, Kim Jong-il, to his son, the inexperienced Kim Jong-un. He's protecting his own regime, he's propping up his son for the future, and he's trying to protect the regime of Kim Jong-il, his father Kim Il-sung, his son Kim Jong-un, for eternity. Many believe that's why the North is being more provocative. In March, the North allegedly torpedoed and sank a South Korean warship, killing 46 sailors. On November 12th, Kim Jong-il's regime unveiled its newest nuclear facility, capable of enriching weapons-grade uranium. It was just stunning. The sophistication of the facility was a surprise to visiting American scientists. I said, oh my God, they actually did what they said they were going to do. South Korea's president, Lee Myung-bak, warned that the South won't tolerate attacks on civilians. As these confrontations escalate, so does the threat of a full-blown Korean confrontation the world has tried to avoid. Celia Hatton, CBS News, Beijing. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, after nine years of war, NATO and Afghan leaders felt the time was right to open a dialogue with the Taliban. They even held secret meetings with an insurgent leader. At least, that's what they thought they did. Here's Chief White House correspondent Chip Reed with one incredible story. In recent months, U.S. and NATO forces have provided safe passage for Taliban leaders from their hideouts in Pakistan to Kabul for preliminary talks with Afghan leaders, including President Hamid Karzai. Both sides hoped the talks might eventually lead to negotiations to end the war. But there's one major problem. Sources say the top Taliban official in the room, Mullah Akhtar Mohammed Mansour, was really an imposter. According to one report, a lowly shopkeeper who received large sums of money from Afghan officials to attend. President Karzai today denied he ever met with the man, calling the reports propaganda. But the top U.S. commander in Afghanistan, who has encouraged talks with Taliban leaders, said he wasn't surprised by reports of a fraud. Uh, there was skepticism uh, about one of these all along. And it may well be that that skepticism was well-founded. Theories of why the man posed as a Taliban leader range from a simple get-rich-quick scheme to an elaborate deception by the Taliban or even Pakistan in retaliation for being cut out of the talks. The damage done is a damage done to the credibility of the United States and 
uh, the Karzai government because they were in essence dealing with a con man. Now, efforts to talk to the Taliban are expected to continue, but this incident is a warning about how easy it is to get burned. Katie? Chip Reed at the White House. Chip, thank you. In health news, an exciting development in the battle against AIDS. A new study finds Truvada, a pill that treats HIV infection, can also prevent the virus from spreading. Researchers say giving Truvada to high-risk men, along with counseling and condom use, reduce their risk of getting HIV by an average of 44 percent. Meanwhile, Pope Benedict says for the first time that condoms are okay to protect against HIV and other diseases. That historic statement is in a new book released today as the UN announced increased condom use has led to a 20 percent drop in new HIV infections worldwide over the past decade. Elaine Quijano has more on the Pope's new approach to AIDS. In Kenya, where more than a million people are infected with HIV, residents cheered the Pope's recent remarks that using condoms to prevent spreading HIV AIDS could be a responsible choice. AIDS is real. I think uh, the Pope and the entire Catholic leadership has realized that. In patris. A top Vatican official was careful to say the Pope was tackling the issue of condoms as disease prevention, not birth control. In the book Light of the World, Pope Benedict says, in the case of some individuals, this can be a first step in the direction of a moralization, a first assumption of responsibility. What the Pope says about condom use doesn't really represent a change in church teaching because the real ban on contraception is really for married couples. Analysts say the church has never formally addressed the issue of contraception outside marriage, making the Pope's comments especially important. What this does is it says, well, maybe if you have a different intention when using a condom, that's in a different moral category, and we can maybe think differently about that. That's the new conversation that we will likely have. Because up until this point, that wasn't even something that was publicly discussed as a possibility. Not, not by the Pope. Given the AIDS crisis, critics have argued the church's disapproval of condom use was morally wrong. But now public health advocates worldwide are applauding the Pope's comments, hoping a more open dialogue might save more lives. Elaine Quijano, CBS News, New York. And coming up next, saving Social Security. Is the answer raising the retirement age to almost 70? And later, springtime in London, where to go if you're invited to that royal wedding. They can see the goal post. The oldest of the baby boomers turns 65 next year, and for many, that means retirement. As more boomers pack it in, the number of Americans collecting Social Security retirement benefits is projected to double over the next 25 years to more than 76 million. The system won't be able to handle the strain without a major overhaul. Tonight, in partnership with USA Today, Anthony Mason continues our series, Senior Moment. Social Security pays out more than $700 billion a year, but the system is headed for a crisis. Americans are living longer, but they're retiring earlier and saving less. Something in that equation has to give. With 70 million baby boomers headed towards retirement, the government is confronting a painful reality. We as a country have made promises we can't keep. Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson, co-chairs of the president's bipartisan deficit commission, have proposed gradually raising the retirement age, now 66 to 69, igniting a debate on Capitol Hill. Congress may argue over how to reform the system, but there's no debate we're running out of time. Under current projections in just 27 years, Social Security won't have enough money coming in to pay out benefits to everyone who's eligible. Today, there are nearly three workers for each Social Security beneficiary. By 2035, there will be only 2.1. This Social Security measure. FDR signed the Social Security Act into law in 1935. What he wanted to do was to establish a principle that somehow, if people had worked all their lives, we, the Americans, owed them security. 
Historian Doris Kearns Goodwin says another intention was to get older workers to retire so younger workers could get jobs. It's ironic that today we're in the opposite direction in wanting the older people to work longer so that we can afford to keep paying them. Social Security was originally designed as insurance against poverty for people in old age. Today, Social Security is paying more and more benefits to people who are essentially middle-aged and middle or high income. In 1950, the typical retiree didn't claim Social Security until age 68. Today, the average claiming age is 63, when typically a retiree has another 20 years to live. Do you think we have to raise the retirement age? Well, I think it's one of the easier things to do to make this thing work, but we shouldn't do it on current seniors. Wisconsin Republican Paul Ryan will head the House Budget Committee in the next Congress. After the retirement age reaches 67, what I would propose is to have the retirement age pegged to longevity. The increases would be phased in over decades. So for my generation, the retirement age will be 67. For my kids, 68, 69 down. It wouldn't reach 70 until the year 2103. Yeah, Nearly a century from now, the workers who'd have to worry about that have not even been born yet. A government study did raise a red flag last week, warning that raising the retirement age would hurt poorer workers the most and increase disability claims by those elderly unable to work. Katie? And Anthony, what about people who have very physical jobs yeah, sure. and they have to retire earlier? Most of these proposals would create a special category for them. The deficit commissions, for example, would create what they call a hardship ex exemption for those who are unable to work beyond 62. And raising the retirement age alone is not going to solve uh, all the problems with Social Security. No, hard to believe, but that's not, that's not enough. All these proposals essentially call for more sacrifices, which likely mean a reduction in benefits for the wealthy as well well as high roll, higher payroll taxes for the wealthy, too. All right. Anthony Mason. Thanks so much, Anthony. And when we come back, a place where turkeys rule the roost, even during Thanksgiving week. In Texas, a Catholic priest charged with sexually abusing a teenage boy is now accused of trying to have the boy killed. John Fiala was arrested after meeting with an undercover police officer last week. The police say a neighbor reported that Fiala had offered him $5,000 to murder the alleged abuse victim. Meanwhile, a scare in the air today. A passenger on a southwest flight from Burbank, California to Phoenix found a fully loaded ammunition clip on the floor. The plane landed safely in Phoenix, but everyone had to be rescreened. An airline spokesman says someone in law enforcement accidentally dropped the clip during a prior flight. Now, you'd figure a turkey would be too chicken to show its face in public during Thanksgiving week, but here in New York City, of all places, a hundred wild turkeys have taken over a neighborhood on Staten Island. They walk where they want, when they want, staring down drivers. If anyone had thoughts of serving one on Thursday, forget it. They're protected by law. And still ahead, William and Kate will make history in a church that has seen quite a lot of it. And finally tonight, the date is set, Friday, April 29th, the Feast of St. Catherine. The place, Westminster Abbey. As Mark Phillips reports, it will be a wedding fit for a future king and his bride and 2,000 of their closest friends. Unlike her granddaughter-in-law-to-be, the queen was not checking out the wedding facilities at Westminster Abbey when she attended a Church of England function there today. It was Kate Middleton who had provided a major wedding location hint when she visited last week. But now it's official. The invitations, perhaps like this one, can go out. William and Kate will join the long list of royals who have used the Abbey for nine weddings, 38 coronations, and 17 funerals over a thousand years. The Queen herself was married here to the then Philip Mountbatten. Side by side they appear heading the procession down the nave. And William's been here before, too. Once at his uncle Prince Andrew's failed marriage to Sarah Ferguson. That's him as a child behind the then happy couple. And that's him at his mother, Princess Diana's, Abbey funeral when he was just 15. Westminster Abbey was always the odds-on favorite for the wedding, although it's a brave choice for William because of his very personal tragic memories here. Still, the other possibility, St. Paul's Cathedral, in marital omens at least, was possibly a worse choice. St. Paul's, where William's parents married, and we know how that ended. 
Both of London's big cathedrals come with royal baggage. They're both, in a sense, associated, I don't want to say tainted, mm. with Princess Diana and that doomed marriage. I mean, we know that Kate Middleton has got the ring of doom already on her engagement <laughs> finger. Kate may now wear Diana's engagement ring, but will this wedding, in these tough times, be another fairy tale extravaganza? The word fairy tale hung over them like the, you know, the moment at which the bad fairy <laughs> appears at your wedding and lays a curse upon you. But are we stuck with it? Uh, we are. For the record, the Queen, and to a lesser extent Kate's parents, will cover the wedding costs, except for the expected $100 million or so security bill. Was that Her Majesty making her first down payment on the Abbey's collection plate? Mark Phillips, CBS News, London. And that is the CBS Evening News for tonight. I'm Katie Couric. Thank you for watching. Good night.